Hello, and welcome to a post that is on science, but it's primarily social commentary. It's called Accelerating Towards a Bottleneck. When I quit my job as an accelerator physicist, I did so largely because I didn't think it served a social good, and it didn't seem like it was very good for my family either. I felt that the work was pointless and that it made me into a social parasite. The scale of inefficiency, miscommunicated goals, and aimless goals made it clear to me that the only reason our research was funded was so that the military-industrial complex could feed off of our gullible, idealistic, narcissistic energy without us feeling like we were developing weapons seemed like a dirty trick. As I stepped back, I saw that this sort of problem was everywhere in scientific work, and that entire fields of research had such diminishing returns that the work was completely pointless. As I stepped back even further, I saw this problem throughout the entire economy. Huge fractions of the workforce are trapped in pointless jobs that they cannot quit because of their student loans. In fact, on average, there appears to be an inverse relationship between the social value of a job and how much a person gets paid. Those who fix cars or teach children resent the amount that banking and internet drones get paid and the banking and internet drones resent people who can feel that their work has value. This inefficient economic structure designed around keeping people busy is responsible for our political polarization and populism, and it is caused by expansionary monetary policies. The flow of money must accelerate in order to sustain current levels of consumption because current consumption patterns can only be maintained if people consume at an accelerated rate. It's a sort of devil's circle. I've wondered what would happen if people slowed down their consumption to bare necessities. What would people do if they became truly free? Photography, writing, reading, debating... Would the supply of luxury goods diminish dramatically and to our detriment? I've wondered about this because the number of authors in the U.S. has remained relatively constant in the post-World War era, despite massive gains in the efficiency of production. This suggests that people are running in place they're not we're not producing more so that we get more freedom we're just producing more to have more perhaps there's a good reason for this experiments conducted with mice suggest that leaving people up to their own devices amid abundance is a recipe for disaster in mouse colonies filled with free food and water Mice got bored and began forming gangs that raped and pillaged until not a single mouse remained in the colony. Perhaps this is the reason that our governments try to keep people locked away in pointless jobs on an imperceptibly accelerating treadmill of consumption. But men are not mice, and mice are not designed to be kept in an artificial enclosure. They are designed to explore and expand their territories, boldly going where no mouse has gone before. Not that I subscribe to dreams of a Star Trek utopia. That has pitfalls of another sort. I do not think that sequestering people in laboratories or spaceships is the path towards happiness. But many people today do. 
China is in the process of designing and building more accelerator laboratories than exist throughout the world combined. They are copying what was done in the West between 1950 and 2000 as big science research labs, spin-offs from the Manhattan Project, cropped up in every first world company, or country, sorry. <laughs> when the Cold War started, Oppenheimer stated that the only way to avoid inevitable catastrophe was to accelerate towards the catastrophe, overshooting it. This strategy required every large country to mine every last drop of uranium and turn all of it into bombs which could be locked away, making the unthinkable truly unthinkable. Today, the internet and automation lead us towards another inevitable catastrophe. Picture automated war machines battling one another while people run for their lives. If one follows Oppenheimer's logic, the only way to avoid this inevitable catastrophe is to accelerate towards it in a race to outrun ourselves. That is perhaps what we are doing through the policy of accelerated economic expansion. If everyone is so busy developing automation technology, they will never have a chance to start a fight. In this framework, resistance to the acceleration is tantamount to treason. This is certainly one way to do things. I'm just not sure it's the only way. That is why I wrote my books. I wanted to think about this in a different context and I wanted to escape from the stress of a life of research, which I'm seeing now um, articles published about studies of the stress levels of researchers, and that I really wasn't the only one who was suffering under this system. When I left the system, I wanted to experience creative magic. And I did, but I also experienced the consequences of the accelerated publishing environment of the internet. Conditions created by this effort to accelerate everything. Four months after I published my feminist first novel, a men's rights activist plagiarized it with help from online ghostwriters who were able to find one another through the magic of the internet. He, this, uh, this, this plagiarist then purchased 90,000 fake Twitter followers, 50 fake reviews on Amazon and Goodreads, a ton of Amazon advertising, and he even did fake reviews on fake websites. I learned about this book when his ads appeared in my email inbox. This was very funny. <laughs> the book I wrote starts with a video job interview in a big, bad, brave new world. The protagonist's work is pointless, and she spends all of her time talking with AIs or with herself until she is fired. She then becomes destitute and is paid to destroy Plutocrat's property. When she leaves the city, she sees another version of herself attacked and eaten by beasts. Unable to communicate, she literally and figuratively eats fruit from the tree of knowledge and gazes into a new sort of mirror, which is responsible for the deaths of most people in the city. Because she survives her look into the mirror, she is turned into a messiah, and finds out what happened to her absent father. The mysterious person who had been guiding her life tells her that he is obsessed with her because he learns from her struggles. She runs away from him, and so on. Altogether, there were 30 plot points that were identical in the same order, and if you calculate 30 factorial and compare that to the number of books in existence since the beginning of time, you'll see that 
this level of overlap is statistically impossible. He copied my plot, and to an extent which is, I, th I think it was illegal. So in my book, the girl was named Alex, and in the book my plagiarist, pub plagiarist published only four months later, with the help of a ghostwriter, the girl was named Renee. The main difference between the characters is that I gave Alex dignity despite adversity, whereas the author of Renee delighted in her degradation. He depicts her getting ridden by an alpha male at the end of his book. What I've learned from this experience is that we used to have a publishing industry that had dignity despite adversity, but with editors replaced by algorithms, this is no longer the case. Clickbait, fraud, plagiarism, and noise rule the day with impacts on our culture that only become clear in hindsight. Noise drowns out the voices that need to be heard. Noise lulls us to sleep while immigrant children are stolen from their parents and collected in internment camps. In a way, the history of music explains our present-day noise. It is an acceleration towards a bottleneck, a sort of zooming-in process, starting back at the dawn of the Enlightenment when music was about everything. It was epic and depicted the world as a whole. Then the Romantic era began and the music sang the songs of the individual soul. The joy, the despair, the currents of mood flowed in sweeping melodies. Then the world wars started and the music became focused even further, with syncopated clink clinks of the keys depicting the zips and zaps of the currents in our minds described by scientists. The meaning could not be deciphered, but it depicted an aspect of ourselves. After the world wars, the music got louder. If you take the words away, you have the banging and booming song sounds, the rock and the roll of abstraction, which has evolved into the pulsing heartbeat of electronica and the cacophony of white noise. This is the song of our dark age. But there are hints of a new enlightenment dawning. We are emerging from an intellectual bottleneck which will select new epic songs to describe the world as a whole. When the world gets noisy, we seek out a refuge, a sort of ark for the mind. Tolkien made an ark that helped minds survive the birth of nuclear power. It preserved our absolute sense of good and evil, and there was an anti-technology message. No unified field theory allowed. Compartmentalize and scatter the knowledge far and wide. People are not ready for that sort of power. Star Trek was the arc that helped minds survive the birth of the computer. It preserved our hope that technology would give our lives meaning, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Let's ignore the fact that this boldness caused us to poison ourselves with neurotoxic triclosan and overexposure to cheap thrills entertainment for years and years. Marvel Comics is the arc of today, yet what is it preserving? It tells us that there are real bad guys out there who need to be defeated, and heroes are required. Thanos and others provide anti-science storylines in which science is only good as long as it is not connected to power. But the overall message is billionaire heroes, government-created heroes, are fighting for you. What would you put into your mental arc? What would you preserve as we accelerate towards an intellectual bottleneck the last intellectual bottleneck occurred during the World Wars 
and Einstein was the mind which had the luck to emerge intact. He avoided military service in the first war and was too old for the second. It is my opinion that this selection set physics back a hundred years, filling our journals and the archives with incomprehensible noise that is destined for the dustbin. I cringed when I saw the Gravitational Wave Observatory win the Nobel Prize, and when a picture of a black hole appeared on the front page of every major newspaper. Only the gullible and uninformed masses applauded, but they will never know that they were tricked, because there is so much noise that the signal of truth cannot break through. My novels don't have a fight the bad guys message. The protagonist submits and escapes. She doesn't chase the bad guy. She only tries to rescue the things she loves. Eventually, the bad guy calms down and stops causing so much destruction. His destructive impulses were driven by loveless, unsatisfied curiosity. The good in my world is the opposite of to boldly go where no man has gone before. In my story, eating from the tree of knowledge either caused a person to kill himself or it made him evil because he hated what he saw in the mirror. But the protagonist survived her look at herself because she didn't have such ridiculous expectations. She served as an example for the bad guy, and he became good. I think this message can help people, and that is why I wrote the books. So I shouldn't be bothered if the message is stolen and copied. I have a roof over my head, and I'm not starving. The important thing is to help people rise above the noise so that they can focus on fixing the problems in their communities and, in many cases, just rejoin their communities. The internet has isolated a lot of people, and workplace culture is isolating as well. When I quit my job, I had to completely, I had to reconnect to the person who I was before, and part of that reconnection involved rediscovering memories from long ago and finding that they were terribly disorganized. I used fiction to help reorganize them, and writing about science has also helped me, helped me reorganize my memories of my physics education, which is a far more chaotic process than I had expected when I embarked upon that journey. I represent just one out of a million books being published per year in the U.S. alone. From a larger perspective, my book is one out of 130 million books in existence in the world. For my voice to break through that amount of noise, would take a lightning strike of historic proportions. Worldwide, at any given moment, one book is being published per thousand people. If you exclude all people living on less than $10 a day, one book is published per hundred people. And even if you are better than 99% of the other authors you see in The Slush Pile, you still only have one chance in 10,000 to be read widely and one chance in a 100 to experience a reasonable amount of success. On top of this, the internet increasingly tilts the literary battleground for our thoughts towards those who are willing to engage in theft and fraud. Perhaps this is to be expected while accelerating through an intellectual bottleneck. I guess that is why I'm not too worried that, although I've written a number of articles and I've tried to 
get the attention of editors of a wide range of online news magazines, I generally get ignored. So I would encourage those of you who know you have something that needs to be said to keep going because the noise won't last forever. And when it dissipates, those who are persistent may be the voices that make it through this bottleneck. Thank you for watching. Um, until next time.